do another drum roll. I'm a little older than some people here, so I've gotten to wear many hats. Mm -hmm. And in the course of my life, and I still am, um, a hypnotherapist, I teach workshops, I have a book called Journey from Anxiety to Freedom, a little bit of first-hand learning there. <laughs> and my most recent, move forward a little, my most recent book is called The Woman in the Photograph, and it's a memoir about a 20-year search to uncover my mother's past mm -hmm. and understand how that generational link gets both passed on and transformed. Mm -hmm. But I'm here tonight to talk about vulnerability through using the tool of the Enneagram. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering how many of you have some familiarity with what the Enneagram <coughs> is. Isn't this the place? <laughs> you can say almost anything and find out that people have some experience with it. But for those who haven't, I'm going to tell you just a little bit about what it is. And pardon me for those of you that are on the side. Um, the Enneagram is a tool that describes the formation of our personality, and in particular, how it wraps around our need to survive. And it does not describe what makes us unique. 
it does not describe that wonderfully authentic self that we all want to tap into. It doesn't describe all the unique ways we respond when we're present and trusting and authentic and inspired. But what it does describe is a way we formulated an ego to survive when we were very, very tiny and very helpless and very dependent on getting other people to love us, to give us attention, to provide for our need. Now, that would be okay if it wasn't for evolution. But evolution has a problem here. I, whenever I work with clients one-on-one, -on -one, I always say, it's not your fault, it's evolution. <laughs> the problem with evolution is that that view of our lives that we embodied when we were newborn got wired into the synapses, got printed into our nervous system. So here we are, 20, 30, 40, 50, in our 60s, and the nervous system still operates when we are in our ego type from the point of view that you've got to like me or I'll die. You, you've got to tell me that you admire me. You've got to let me have some power. You can't hurt my feelings. You can't tell me you don't like me. You can't do any of those things because I'll die. And so evolution has crossed two things that we need to untangle. It's crossed the human drive to survive, which is how we got here, with a psychological belief that I won't survive unless I get this strategy played out that I figured out when I was two months old or two years old, that somehow psychologically and emotionally will make me feel safe. Does that sound at all plausible? Yes. <laughs> Here's the problem. We now associate being vulnerable, being uncomfortable, uh, not feeling liked, um, all those ways not being in control, Somewhere in our psychological makeup, we think that we're now unsafe. So I want you to consider that for a minute. And if there's even one major thing you take from tonight, because with all these wonderful speakers, you're going to take a lot. But if you had to take one thing from me, it would be to begin to unwrap. You want to do it with me right now? Kind of unwrap the tangle that feeling uncomfortable, or not getting someone's pleasure, or feeling not in control makes you unsafe. Yourself untangling it in the days ahead. Because obviously I have common sense. If I'm in a threatening situation that's going to do me harm, I'm going to leave it. I'm going to draw a line. I'm going to get in my car. I'm going to call a friend. But I couldn't do those things when I was two days old. So we, we have to untangle and realize I can take care of myself even if you're not pleased with my behavior. And I can take care of myself <coughs> listening to my body, all the wonderful ways we're hearing about tonight. But I have to remember that my automatic major personality response is a habit and not my true self. So as I was pacing up and down this afternoon, because I'm one of those people who's kind of, I, I don't know, I, I have explained it. I'm very left brain and I'm very right brain. And I'm logical about a lot of things, but when it comes to giving a talk, I cannot stuff my talk into an outline, no matter how hard I try. <laughs> it just isn't going to follow the sequence. And so I do feel vulnerable, but am I unsafe? No. Is my life threatened? No. But then there's that word trust that's come up a few times tonight. 
So I was going through my email and somebody sent me a post that she was starting a 21 day retreat at home with postings from Deepak Chopra. And the posting she sent me today said, the difference between the true self and the everyday self. And I went, yeah, I'm on track. <laughs> <laughs> That's kind of my topic and it's kind of why I put uh, an Enneagram picture on your seats. And you don't really have to study it right now. I have to admit, you're not going to leave here tonight having a deep knowledge of the Enneagram unless you do already or what your type is. But I want you to understand that we each have a formation. It's a little bit like you wouldn't be insulted if I said to you, everybody here has a skeletal system. You wouldn't go, Oh, stop putting me in a box. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's good to know. It's good to know that even though you're flying through the air and feel free, it's built on something. And our personalities, our response really is built on something. And the Enneagram, I'm not going to give you the whole history. I'll only let you know. It really came together in the 70s in Berkeley between the world of spirit and the world of psychology, and it's since been written about and codified and reused. And it sees our personality types as nine varieties or nine points. And the way we work with it is to especially see how our personality is wrapped around our strengths. And the reason I want you to see your personality is because it's our friend, it's our servant, it's how we navigate, but it's not our true self. Mm -hmm. And to be in this authentic, expansive, unified, creative world of all possibilities, we have to notice when our habitual personality is driving us, because that is not vulnerable. Mm -hmm. Vulnerable is having boundaries, it doesn't mean exposing all your secrets, it doesn't mean telling your whole life story. Vulnerable means noticing you're on automatic pilot. You meet somebody and immediately you go, what do I have to say so they'll like me? What do they expect from me so that I'll get that positive response and not a frown? And you notice that and you go, ding! What if I shifted to being vulnerable, meaning present in my body, in the unknown? Because if I don't play my automatic personality, I don't know what's going to come out of my mouth. I don't know how you'll respond. I know if I shower you with flattery, you'll smile. But if I don't shower you, you might not smile at me. Do I need you to smile at me to be safe? At the moment you notice what is automatic, ding, it's going to be quiet, ding, it doesn't have to hit you over the head. <laughs> At the moment you notice, take a breath. And in the awareness so many of you have, it's not that you need the Enneagram to notice, but it's mighty helpful because the ego is sneaky. It wants us to think this is all wisdom and not a system of survival that is out of date. So I want to give you a little taste. We divide the Enneagram types and you can read the handout at home and you can look up online and there are lots of books. I recommended a few very different ones but right here and now I want you to touch in to the three different centers of intelligence that are the basis for the Enneagram. And just taking a moment to feel your feet on the ground and to, to shift your attention there, starting first with your mind. And just notice the center of the mind, the area of thought. Notice how comfortable that is, how familiar that is. <coughs> Is that the place you immediately go to your fallback position when presented with some 
uncertainty or some new situation? Does it feel like home? Just noticing. Noticing how available <laughs> this is, how easy or hard it was to go into your thoughts. And then just dropping down into the heart center. And however you do that, however you just release, use your breath, touch your heart, if that helps you feel that sense of dropping your energy field more into your chest, into your shoulders. And we call this the center of relating, the place where emotions are the currency, the center where we're kind of zeroing in on what other people might be feeling. The center where we're very conscious of how other people feel us and where we want to connect. And where the way they see us suddenly becomes the mirror for how we see ourselves. The world of relating and emotions. And notice again, is this the first place when you walked in the room tonight? Is this the first place you dropped into when you met someone new? Is it accessible? Is it familiar? Do you live here? Or do you visit here on weekends? And then dropping into the gut, into that first chakra center, what we call the roots, the intelligence of the body, the intelligence of sensation. You know, we use that expression, I just got a gut feeling. As we heard earlier, for some of us at times in our lives, that gut feeling isn't that always a happy one. Sometimes the gut is telling us when there's something we need to look at. But again, notice how naturally do you drop into that gut instinct place? Is it familiar? Is it home? Do you automatically go there when you walk into a new situation and want to be grounded? Or not so much? And I know this is kind of fast, but I'm just going to be quiet for 30, 40 seconds for you just to notice for yourself which of these centers really feels familiar, especially where you go in new situations or challenging situations or most habitually. Just notice if you can connect to one more than the others. Or maybe before you got all this wisdom and awareness. <coughs> And then coming back to the room, feel your feet on the floor, feel your eyes open. For today, we won't have a chance to share with your partner, but on the handout when you go home, you might play around a little bit with circling the center that's most familiar to you today. It doesn't have to be a permanent <coughs> decision, but I want to give you something that you can use as a reference in your everyday life. So instead of, here I am, it's, here I am. Oh, wait a minute. Let me see. What am I really listening to? Am I really listening to my gut instinct? Am I really weighing the pros and cons of thinking this and what if that? Am I really trying to figure out how to get this person to come closer and to like me? I mean, just to begin to notice begins to give you that choice of saying, hmm, wait a minute. Can I come back to vulnerability in this moment? It's not that one center is better than another, and each of the three Enneagram types is sort of connected more to one of those centers. It's all about, do we need any strategy at all for this moment? Can I be present and 
I once heard Pema Chodron talk about befriending your obstacles. Mm -hmm. When we talk about vulnerability, can we befriend being uncomfortable? Because instead of going to the automatic strategy, we're in the unknown. We don't know what that person's facial expression is going to give us back. Mm. Is it dangerous? No, it was dangerous when we were two months old. So what I want to leave you with is this just interesting experiment of beginning to notice your habitual strategies and physical default places. And when you look at the handout, you'll see there's a little uh, exercise where you can circle the statement that most describes you or most describes how you see yourself. And use that not as a judgment, but as a jumping off point. So when you're just having a conversation <coughs> with a friend, a little light bulb goes on, a little ding that goes, what if right now I entered into the present moment? What if right now I entered into the unknown? Because if I don't control the interaction in that way, I really don't know. I don't even know what will come out of my mouth. I don't know what will come from you. But that is the field of possibilities. That's the field where something can happen that never happened before, as we were just hearing about earlier. And that's the field where we begin to transform our observing process from, oh no, this is dangerous, to, oh yes, I'm just switching out of my habitual personality to savor the present moment. And I will finish with a quote from Rima Body Work. I don't know if you know, it's a form of body work that's been wonderful for me that goes along with an attitude. And the phrase is, to receive the gifts of existence, you need to be present. So I encourage you, if the Enneagram is a useful tool for you, or if your own observations of what's the most automatic way that you deal with meeting people in stressful situations, whatever the most automatic way is, that's the blind spot. It's not the place where you dwell in the wholeness and abundance of the unified world. So just. I encourage you to bring that self-observation into your everyday life and be surprised at the generosity of existence and what it's holding to offer us when we open wide. So you can finish with this opening wide. If you tap your neighbor, that's okay too. <laughs> opening wide <laughs> and taking a breath. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm.